All right, so today we are wrapping up the Cross Culture series, Biblical Clarity and Cultural Chaos. Uh, it's been a fun eight weeks, right? Uh, talking about some of the chaotic issues we face, like sexuality and gender, gender roles, marriage, divorce, abortion, poverty, and justice. Among other things today, as we're wrapping up, we will be talking about race. That's right. So how can the Bible shed some light on this issue? How can uh, maybe we, we uh, gather a little truth uh, that can maybe bring us a little clarity for this? Uh, I do want to acknowledge just a couple things at the beginning. Um, number one, first, my, my hope is that really anything that I say comes across with a spirit of humility this morning. Hopefully every morning, but uh, particularly this morning. Uh, I am not, uh, obviously, uh, in an ethnic minority in this community that we live in, although I have traveled internationally a little bit, and so I at least, uh, you know, can, can imagine what it might be like to uh, live that way. But my experience with the issue of race and racism is going to be different than somebody uh, who uh, does look different. So that, that does not, however, mean, though, that the Bible verses will mean different things for different people. It just means our experience, the way we take them, uh, is going to be different depending on where you're from. So the second thing is because this is uh, you know, this is our unique area that we live in, uh, demographics and all. Our application of some of the biblical gospel-centered truth that we find in the Bible is um, our, our application will not be the same as if it would be like if we lived in Oakland, right? <laughs> so, um, but again, that doesn't change the truth of the scripture. It just simply changes how we might live out some of these things tomorrow morning when we uh, go to work. And so to begin our time, and you know, hopefully to kind of set the tone for this uh, very nuanced, complex, culturally divisive issue, I'm going to do something that I haven't done in a while. Um, some of you guys probably uh, have not seen me uh, do this yet, especially with a difficult topic. Now, uh, how many of you guys are familiar with the phrase, uh, can you explain this to me like I'm five years old? Right? So, um, so here it is. I have a book that I would like to read to you that might help us as we begin our time together on this. Now, seriously, this is a book that I, uh, I read to my girls. Uh, the author is a lady named Trillia Newbell, and she's a, a very accomplished author in addition to uh, multiple books that she's written, uh, this book included, but she also has uh, written articles for Gospel Coalition, Lifeway Publishing, the ERLC, um, just, you know, really, really put a lot of good content out. So um, this book is called God's Very Good Idea, and I'm going to share some of that with you right now. In the beginning, in fact, before the beginning, God had a very good idea. God's idea was to make people, lots of people, lots of different people, who would all enjoy loving him and all enjoy loving each other. They would all be made in his image. They would all be like mirrors reflecting what God is like. Because God is full of love, they would be full of love too. So God got to work. He made a beautiful world for people to live in. Then he made the first people, a man and a woman. And he said to them, be happy. Enjoy loving me and loving each other. Have a huge family that will fill the earth and look after the earth and enjoy the earth. We live in God's world. We are all different, but we are also all the same. Everyone you see is different than you and the same as you. They might look different or speak different or play different, but they are all made in God's image, and so they are all valuable. This is God's very good idea. But, one more tray. People ruined God's very good idea. The first people chose not to love God. This is called sin. Sin. And because they chose not to love God as they should, they forgot how to love each other as they should. 
we are the same. We choose not to love God, and so we are not able to love each other like we should. We sin. Sometimes we treat others badly because they are different than us. People fight with each other. People are mean to each other. People laugh at each other. Because we have ruined God's very good idea, he is not pleased with us. Our sin means we can't be friends with him or enjoy living with him. We need God's forgiveness for ruining his very good idea. It's the same for everyone in the world. People who like reading need forgiveness. People who like riding bikes need forgiveness. People with darker skin need forgiveness. And people with lighter skin need forgiveness. People with curly hair need forgiveness. And people with straight hair need forgiveness. But God was not surprised by people ruining things. He had always had a very good plan to rescue his very good idea. And so God got to work. He came to earth as a person, Jesus. Jesus loved people who were different than him. He loved people who no one else loved. He always enjoyed loving all the different people he met. Jesus shows us how to enjoy loving each other. But people didn't love Jesus. Instead, they hated him. They put him on a cross to die. But this was part of God's plan. On the cross, Jesus took our sin so that we can be forgiven. Jesus forgives his people for their sins. Jesus didn't stay dead. He rose back to life and then went back to live in heaven. And then he gave people his spirit to help them enjoy loving him and loving all the different people they know. Jesus helps us to love each other. One day, God will finish his very good idea. Jesus will come back and make the world perfect again. And anyone who has asked Jesus to forgive them will live there with their different languages and skin colors. They will enjoy loving God and loving each other. They will enjoy praising God for making, rescuing, and finishing his very good idea. But here is a very, very, very good part of God's very good idea. You don't have to wait until then to enjoy it. Because Jesus welcomes anyone who asks him to forgive them. And when Jesus welcomes someone, he welcomes them into his family forever. He welcomes people who like reading and people who like riding bikes. He welcomes people with darker skin and people with lighter skin. He welcomes people with curly hair and people with straight hair. God's family is called the church. Your church friends are your brothers and sisters, your wonderful and colorful church family. You can enjoy loving them and loving God with them. This is God's very good idea. Lots of different people enjoying loving him and loving each other. God made it. People ruined it. He rescued it. He will finish it. And with your church family, you can enjoy being part of it right now. I could probably just stop there, huh? Very good. Uh, this is a, a series of children's books called uh, Telling the Truth, I think. There's a, there's, I've used uh, one of these in a message before. You might remember about the tabernacle, believe it or not. So um, this, uh, something you might not have realized that first pass through this book is that many of the thoughts and even um, some of the scripture passages that we have been talking about and studying throughout this series uh, of cross-culture were actually in this uh, story that we just read. It was just maybe packaged in a little different way that our kids, and let's face it, us, could probably um, just maybe digest a little better. For example, uh, talking about our identity, right? Who we are. What does it mean to be a person? What does it mean to be a man uh, or a woman? You know, that was kind of the focus of our first uh, four weeks of the series. Gender, marriage, family, divorce, abortion. We saw that the Bible teaches that all people are made in God's image, be and because of that, all people have value. All people are worthy of dignity. And so, uh, just like we read in the book, right, uh, God's idea was to make people. They would be made in his image. They'd be like mirrors reflecting what God is like. He made a beautiful world for people to live in. He said to them, be happy, enjoy loving me, and enjoy loving each other. Have a huge family that will fill the earth and look after the earth and enjoy the earth. So that's pretty much a paraphrase of Genesis 1, 27 and 28, which says, so God created man in his own image. 
In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So part of what it means to be human is to realize we were created by God and we were given a special job that's different than all other uh, parts of creation. You know, God created everything, including this perfect garden called Eden that he set the man and the woman into and then gave them the task of carrying on his work. Right, the, uh, the sense in which they were there to work and to keep the garden, and yet they also were to fill the earth and subdue it, meaning uh, eventually they were to, to take that work outside of the garden and make the rest of the world a perfect place like Eden. You know, sometimes we call that the cultural mandate. You know, kind of just like God took the raw materials, well, he created raw materials out of thin air, and then he used those raw materials like dirt to form and shape things and blow life into them. Um, we also do that as, as human beings, right? We take raw materials of the earth and we, we create, we build things, uh, whether it's uh, actual buildings, you know, architecture, whether it's music or literature, uh, just agriculture, growing things. We create in a similar way to God. Now, uh, we've, we have seen, though, I think, that um, the prevailing culture of our day does not agree with the Bible on the answer to who are we. You know, culture would say, uh, kind of the prevalent uh, cultural uh, narrative would say, your identity is not what the Bible tells you it is. It's whatever you believe uh, you are deep down, your authentic self. And so we've really kind of been looking at these two different worldviews uh, this whole time, right? The kind of the prevailing uh, worldly culture we're calling kind of just this radical individualism, the belief that whatever I believe about myself deep down has to be true. And not only that, but then the rest of the world has to uh, support my truth. Um, This expressive individualism, it's basically the right to define my own concept of existence. Now, hopefully by now, um, we all know why this causes so much chaos in our relationships, right? How can my marriage and my family thrive if I believe I have to be true to whatever I feel like I need to do to be my authentic self, no matter how selfish? How can our relationships be healthy if, if, we, if, we, if we disregard the biblical creation categories of male and female or, or uh, think they can be interchangeable? How can we value life if we don't show honor to every human being no matter, uh, this, no matter the state of their life? Um, you know, pretty simply said, there's, uh, the culture, our culture today is really in conflict with the biblical worldview in a lot of ways. And so if somebody believes that their sexuality defines their identity, meaning who they are is tied to that, then of course they are going to be offended if you tell them that their sexual activity is out of bounds according to God's design for humanity. And this is important because if we, if we, if we are following Jesus, if we want to follow Jesus, we are required to know the truth of what the Bible teaches, are we not? Um, but we are also required to speak that truth in love. Ephesians 4, 14, and 15 says, uh, So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful, in deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. So how we do this is important. Right? So if kind of the, the first half was uh, looking at who we are, the last four weeks have been uh, how are we to treat one another? How do we treat people fairly? You know, what, if anything, do we owe another person by nature of our shared humanity? This kind of falls under the umbrella topic of justice. We covered poverty, social justice, uh, civility, tribalism. How we ought to love one another as God has loved us. Right, kind of summarizing uh, the prophet Micah, Micah 6, uh, 6 and 8. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Verse 8, he has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness 
and to walk humbly with your God. Now, this is really kind of, uh, I think, a, you know, a little bit of a paradigm-shifting verse. Uh, many people, you know, Christian and, and not, have probably heard um, at least the second half of verse 8, right? Probably, maybe even seen it on a billboard. Do justice, love kindness, walk humbly with your God. Nice enough. But really what verses 6 and 7 are telling us is that Really, when it comes to what matters, the external forms of our religion, their religion might be riding motorcycles. So the external forms of our religion um, are no good, are not pleasing to the Lord if we don't have the heart issues right. So if, you know, if we're in church every Sunday, if we're, uh, if we're reading the Bible three times a day, if we give all of our money away to feed the poor, um, but we don't walk humbly with God and we don't love kindness and we don't uh, do justice, then um, it doesn't do us any good. And so part of, part of how this fits together is how we treat each other the reason that we treat each other the way we do is based on who we are, men and women created in God's image. And so that applies also to the issue of race and racism. You know, what about the issue of race? Is the Bible silent on racism? Um, does it kind of give a wink and a nod, or, or maybe even, um, as some people would say, uh, the Bible endorses uh, race-based slavery? Some historically have claimed that. Now, Obviously, from a, sort of a worldly point of view, worldly culture, it shouldn't surprise us uh, that some people think this. But even some people who claim to be Christians would say that some parts of the Bible are not worth obeying because they endorsed some of these uh, ideas like slavery, right? Or, or they might say you can't take the Bible literally uh, because uh, parts of it are oppressive to minorities and to women. Is that true? No. No, it's not. And we wouldn't all be here this morning if that was the case. If we, all, if we believed that, we wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't be here doing this. Now, um, the first couple of messages in this series really dealt specifically with kind of what, what we see the biblical teaching on men and women, uh, what, that, what those teachings are, um, and how the Bible really gives us an extremely countercultural uh, but still beautiful picture of the complementary nature of men and women. So you can listen to those if you missed them. Uh, but what about racism? I mean, does the Bible condone slavery? Now, answer again, full-hearted, no, it doesn't. But uh, there are some uh, comments worth making about it. First, and sadly, it's true that there are verses in the Bible that were used in the past to support uh, the system of race-based, what we would call chattel slavery. Uh, which is where people of another race were bought and sold like livestock uh, and became the property of another person. Now, some of the verses that they used were out of Paul's epistles, uh, where he was instructing slaves to be obedient to their masters. Now, if any of you have looked into this before, then you know the answer to that, which is that the slavery of the ancient world, uh, the world in which Paul was writing, uh, was much more of an employer-employee relationship than what we know as sort of the transatlantic slave trade of the 15 through 1800s. Now, in some Bible translations, uh, they'll actually note for us, give us a note, the uh, alternate reading of that Greek word can be translated slave or bond servant. You know, in the ancient system, it was not race-based, and it was uh, usually an agreement that was entered into willingly by both parties. It was for a set period of time after which the slave or the bond servant was free to move on. And so, no, the, the Bible never endorsed uh, slavery as we know it, the African slave trade. In fact, some of the leading voices of the abolition of the slave trade were Christians, like William Wilberforce. And they were motivated by the very things that we have been talking about, the dignity and, the wor and worth of every human being made in the image of God. That's really what brought down uh, slavery in the 1800s. You know, the Bible is probably the most anti-racist, and I mean that in the literal sense, not sort of the social justice ideological sense, uh, but the Bible is the most anti-racist book ever written, I think. Um, you know, there's a, there's a couple of stories even um, 
Uh, Numbers chapter 12, we read that Moses, uh, Moses had a wife uh, that was a Cushite woman. So uh, we read there's a conflict between Aaron and Miriam and Moses, and one of the reasons that they give is because of Moses' wife being a Cushite, which uh, in that time, uh, Cush was a place in northern Africa. And so a lot of scholars see that there's actually a little bit of a racial, a lot of a racial undertone in that um, because uh, Moses had married uh, somebody that was ethnically different from them, they were trying to kind of uh, uh, question his leadership. And have you, have you guys heard that story before? So, you know, uh, what happens to Miriam? She gets struck with leprosy in the middle of the whole account. Don't worry, though, she gets better. But uh, it's, uh, there's, there's ways in which the Bible, uh, the Bible portrays people, warts and all, right? So, you know, there are things in the Bible that we would say are not the best way to, uh, uh, not, not, not living according to God's way. Polygamy is one of those, too. You know, we know that some of the, uh, some of the ancient patriarchs had multiple wives. Uh, but we also know that the original creation ideal that Jesus affirms is one man and one woman in one marriage. And so, but what we also see uh, in these stories is that the Bible gives us a pretty clear picture that um, these ways of uh, living are, are not, will, will, not, will not end well, right? Will not be good. Um, so, you know, one of the other things uh, that we see in the New Testament um, in Galatians chapter 2, there's an incident where, uh, where Peter has to confront Paul because he was uh, changing his behavior based on who showed up uh, to the party. Um, so this is what Paul says in Galatians 2, uh, verse 12. Before certain men came from James, uh, Peter was eating with the Gentiles, non-Jewish people. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. And so when Paul sees this, he says, I saw their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel. And so he confronted Peter to his face. We, uh, we know why that's important. In the next chapter in Galatians 3, uh, 27 through 29, he says, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. Everyone who believes in Jesus becomes part of God's family, right? There are no second-class citizens in heaven, just like we read in the storybook. And so, you know, you might be saying to yourself, you know, yes, uh, okay, Brian, that all sounds great. So, I mean, is the main idea that we're just kind of done with racism now, right? Is it gone? Has it disappeared? What about racism today? You know, I remember uh, the summer of 2020, being just about glued to the, ni- to the live news videos of uh, some of major U.S. cities on fire. Uh, I was 10 years old, so old enough to remember um, when the incident with uh, police brutality in Rodney King sparked the 92 L.A. riots. And did you know that it, wasn't in ni- it was 1995 before a majority of the American public actually approved of interracial marriage? And it's only been 50 years since that's been uh, legal everywhere. A few years back, a Florida police chief was found guilty of commanding officers to arrest black people for crimes they did not commit in order to give the impression that his department was solving crimes. Like literally, they just, they would, they would find an unsuspecting black person and just pin something on him so they could get the case cleared. Now, should we be past the point where people get discriminated against based on their skin color? Yeah. Are we? No. Wow. 
Why not? Because people ruined God's very good idea. The first people chose not to love God. This is called sin. They chose not to love God as they should. They forgot how to love each other as they should. We are the same. We choose not to love God, and so we are not able to love each other like we should. We sin. Sometimes we treat others badly because they are different than us. So um, I want to share a, a, a video clip with you from uh, John Perkins, who you may or may not be familiar with his work. He has uh, really been a huge figure in the civil rights movement. Um, he is a passionate, devoted follower of Jesus. He has uh, really given his life to pursue uh, this uh, justice and racial reconciliation. Um, and one of the reasons that I, I, I love, uh, I've, I've really enjoyed reading some of his writings and, and listening to some of the, the talks that he's given is uh, because he really does believe that the gospel uh, and the church, so kind of the gospel played out in the church, lived out by Christians, both white and black, is really the only way that we're going to get there. Um, and so, uh, yeah, if we could play this uh, clip from a talk he gave. We have to recognize the fact that human beings bear the image of God. He, lay, he took that clay and molded it up, made these beautiful bodies, and then he laid down on it and imprinted himself an image. And then he kissed life into existence. And we walking around asking whose life matter. Oh, it's sad. It's sad because we uncompromised it so long. We in the best interpretation of the dignity of humanity is the American Constitution. And the church has never taken that on. Even after the Civil War and all of that, we backed up. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men is created equal, as an endowed by their creator with certain rights, chief among those are life, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Why don't we church champion that cause? That's the best language I know. That's the best language. It, it, it clips the Magna Carta and all other laws. The problem is that we don't understand justice. That God created this humanity to know him, to make him known, and to love one another would be the sign that we belong to him. Because love is of God, he that love is born again of God in one family. And he that loves not knoweth not God because God is love. Yeah, so he's been preaching that for many decades. Uh, if you're interested in more of his story, he's got a really great autobiography uh, called Let Justice Roll Down um, from all the way back when he was a uh, young guy in, uh, I believe, Mississippi, where they grew up. And his, I mean, pretty much watched his brother get murdered by the sheriff. Um, for talking too loud, and uh, that kind of started, um, yeah, just a really amazing story, and, and, you know, again, just a guy that has uh, really given his life to the Lord first, but then uh, did this really kind of amazing work in uh, reconciliation. So, how do we avoid, so kind of, uh, how do we avoid becoming a casualty in one of these culture wars? Right? How do we navigate the minefield of culture? And not, not just race, although that's a big one, but everything else. First, we need uh, situational awareness. You guys might have heard that term before, right? So, and that really is part of the heart behind why we kind of did eight weeks in this special series. Uh, what does the Bible say about some of the things that we are confronted with culturally? Um, if we are to speak the truth in love and in humility and in gentleness but with confidence, um, you know, there are some things we need to wake up to, right? Now, in terms of racism, we should be aware that there are people today who will not associate with someone who looks different from them, right? And to, we can't control that. We can't control that for other people necessarily. But what we can say, um, and I think we can commit to one another, that that'll never be true here, right? And that'll never be true with us. You know, and I, I mean, I do think even just this little place in Murphy, 
I mean, I think we're always going to strive to be a place that the gospel uh, really kind of shapes this attitude that we have, right? Like, there just simply, I don't think there's ever going to be space for an attitude of, uh, I'm, I'm, be- I'm better than the person next to me. So we should make sure there's never any soil for that weed to grow in, right? Um, we believe the gospel is for all people. And so God's family is made up of all different kinds of people. And so in order to be a welcoming place for all people, uh, we do need to be aware of uh, past and potentially present uh, discrimination that happens even here in our little corner of the world. You know, it wasn't that long ago that the KKK could march down 6th Street. Even today, I mean, I know people who have been treated poorly because of how they look at stores, even by law enforcement officers here locally, although uh, I think the vast majority um, would condemn that in a heartbeat. But we can, we can gain so much ground just by being aware that there has been real hurt and real damage done to people by both other people and by unjust laws. And it is appropriate for us to mourn with those who mourn and weep with those who weep. But we also need to be careful not to let uh, how we feel about an issue pull us into one extreme or another. Which is kind of the second part of the the situational awareness that we need as we go forward. Um, We really need to be praying, seeking the Lord for continual discernment and wisdom regarding these issues, whether race, sexuality, gender, social inequality. There's a lot of untruth out in the world about these things. Uh, Ephesians 4.14 is so, uh, I think, appropriate to that. that, uh, So we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. There are a lot of falsehoods out there, a lot of deceitful schemes. To get to the truth, sometimes it takes some work. Um, I will say, study your Bible first. Information, even if it's the right information, the correct information, will not help you if your character is underdeveloped. I'll repeat that. So... Even the correct information, the correct situational awareness will not help you if your character is uh, underdeveloped or not formed, out of shape. And that happens through time in the Word. That happens through your prayer life. That happens through uh, being in community, in life group. We need to work on being slow to speak, quick to listen. We need to, if, if we're concerned with doing justice, which we should be, we first need to learn how to walk humbly with our God and to learn to love kindness. You know, in the final uh, chapter of the book, Strange New World, which has kind of been a trusty companion throughout this series, um, Carl Truman relates a conversation he had with a friend that I think is an appropriate way uh, to end our time today. So um, his friend is somewhat of a proponent of Uh, something called the Benedict Option. Have you, any of you heard that term before? Okay, so the Benedict Option uh, is kind of this idea that, you know what, culture has, uh, is is maybe too far gone. You know, too much, uh, there, you know, it's basically, culture today is a black hole of virtue. There's no, uh, it's irredeemable. So the best course of action for uh, followers of Jesus, disciples of Jesus, is to really sort of withdraw into uh, kind of more closed off communities and, and, um, and just kind of focus uh, on, uh, on developing character and virtues and, and, um, and one another in these sort of closed off uh, protected places. And, uh, you know, there's some historical uh, precedents for that in the Middle Ages and uh, monasteries and things like that, that um, God did good things through that. But, uh, but Truman kind of teases his friend about being pessimistic about the future. And so his friend disagrees. He says, uh, I'm neither pessimistic nor optimistic, he said, but I am hopeful. And so this idea of um, 
not being pessimistic, not being optimistic, but being hopeful, I think is actually a very, uh, a very Christian way to, uh, to, to, to go to work tomorrow, right? Um, because hope and optimism are not the same thing, right? We can be optimi- optimistic for no good reason. Just hold on, things will get better. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. Uh, Will everything be fine? Now, Christian hope is not optimistic, it's realistic. It's a, it's really being confident and it's uh, in the belief that no matter how badly we have ruined things, God will rescue it and God will finish it. Right? This world is not our home. This is not our final destination. We shouldn't, we shouldn't be completely comfortable and be at the point in life where well, we could never wish for anything more because everything is just perfect. We should care about the world we live in. We should care a lot about the people that live uh, around us, that we interact with. We should work really hard to make things better. That includes issues of, uh, of uh, economic inequality, racism. But this is not all there is to look forward to, right? Jesus promised to come back. And so um, Revelation 7, 9 through 12 gives us just this sort of picture. Like this is, this is where we're headed, right? This is where we're going for. John uh, writes this. After this, I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne, and all the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. People from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages. That'll be the day, right? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, uh, we thank you for the time that you've given us this morning. Lord, we do pray that you continue your work uh, to make us the people that you have created us to be. Lord, we confess uh, that there are so many times and so many ways that, uh, Lord, we have sinned and we have fallen short. But Lord, we thank you that you love us, Lord, that you uh, forgive us. Lord Jesus, we thank you that, uh, that ultimately it is your work, Lord, putting uh, your family together uh, is, is your work. And so uh, we pray that you will, uh, you will continue that work here in us and in this community. Lord, we pray that uh, we will be a, uh, a place where, uh, Lord, there is not partiality. Lord, a place where uh, all, all are uh, welcomed. Lord, a, a place where uh, we truly believe the gospel, that Lord Jesus, you died for our sins and you rose again, that all who believe in you will uh, be raised again to new life. Lord, we thank you that that truth extends across uh, racial lines, across uh, gender lines, uh, across political lines, across time and space. Lord, we thank you uh, just for the eternalness of your truth. And so, Lord, we pray as we, uh, as, as we move on from uh, this, this series that, uh, Lord, you will uh, allow us to uh, be firm-footed in the culture today, Lord, in the chaos that sometimes seems uh, to rage around us. But, Lord, we can have a confidence uh, in you, in your truth. Lord, we can share the truth with uh, our friends and our family, our loved ones, our neighbors, even those who disagree with us, and we can do that lovingly. We can do that gently and humbly, uh, but also boldly. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.